Thank you all for coming. Um, this, I hope, will be a little um, taste of what we do and what's coming. Uh, Jay Campbell is known for the diverse spectrum of his repertoire and the, his eclectic musical interests. He's a total champion of the new and innovative. A total champion. He's a graduate of Juilliard. He was a recipient of the prestigious Avery Fisher Career Grant in 2016. He was the artist in residence at the Lucerne Festival last summer, along with Patricia Kopachinska. And his work with some of the most creative musicians of our time, including Pierre Boulez, Elliot Carter, Matthias Pincher, John Adams, Kaya Sariajo. That's a list that sounds suspiciously like an Ojai Festival <laughs> alumni. <laughs> Plus countless of others uh, of his own generation. He's had a very close association with the composer John Zorn in New York, who has written many works for him. He's recorded many of his works. And in 2016, Jay became the cellist of the Jack Quartet. The Jack Quartet is a group that's been called superheroes of the new music world. It's been called the go-to quartet for contemporary music, tying impeccable musicianship and intellectual ferocity and a take-no-prisoner sense of commitment. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Jay Campbell.
Ojais that we can sort of do everything from a combination of the old and the new, and boy, there's an example. <laughs> um, but you have to let the cat out of the bag about the iPhones at Ojai. There's a piece that the quartet is doing by Pauline Oliveras for cell phones. Yes. Well, uh, it technically could be for anything. Like, I could play it here by myself. Uh, it's for any sustaining instruments. So there could be voice. Uh, there's a great recording of her doing it uh, with herself singing and her playing accordion. Um, and it's kind of this uh, contradictory score. There's one line of instruction, and it is sustain a tone and hold on to that tone until your desire to change that tone leaves you, and then change the tone. <laughs> Which sounds kind of silly, but actually once, if you could really buy into it, like the mentality of that, and you know, get into this very introspective uh, Zen type of mindset, it actually is very interesting to do. So a friend of ours, um, he adapted this piece for what he called iPhone Consort, and he made an app where the gyroscope and the phone can control either pitch or volume. Um, and then you can, you have different people placed around the audience, you could walk around, you have people <coughs> in the audience, uh, each performer could choose, you know, how performative they want to be. Uh, so when I, I did this once at the Lucerne Festival and they, uh, I had some people who really didn't want to be seen, so they were very slyly <laughs> taking their iPhones out. <laughs> One person was really over the top about it. But it's cool, because then you don't actually know where any of these sounds are coming from, and the way that they interact in the air is really incredible. Well, we're going to work out a way so that members of the public who want to get into this can download the app and Great. participate. Yeah. So it could be your chance. I want to sort of step back for a moment and ask some questions, Jay, about your background. Um, you know, your Juilliard pedigree suggests somehow that you would be a mainstream musician. But what made you who you are, which isn't far from mainstream? I mean, you're a renegade. You're a champion of the new. I mean, what happened? Where did I go wrong? It could be where, you, where did you go right. But, but what, relate your training to what you're doing today. Yeah, um, well, I grew up improvising a lot and composing a lot. Um, so for me, the idea of doing something new was not far from me uh, at any point. I would work on old pieces with my teacher, um, but my main curiosity was what was of the time of now. Uh, and I didn't know about any of those composers or anything, so basically my outlet for that was improvising on the piano, improvising on the cello, composing all those types of things. Um, so it was a really slow development of actually realizing that there's a lot of contemporary music written for the cello, there's a lot of composers out there whose music I could play. Uh, I kept on composing through high school until I realized that I wasn't that great of a composer um, and there's already a sizable body of mediocre music <laughs> and I didn't want to contribute to it. Um, so I figured I would be better suited to just you know, help uh, give platform to composers because there really is not that many um, people who are actively trying to program composers' music. They're, they very much get uh, shelved and are kind of second class citizens in the music world, which is funny because they're the ones who are actually creating this yeah. the art, and we're the ones who are really realizing it. Um, so that also was another dynamic that was really attractive to me: the idea of working with a composer, working with a composer who is alive. Um, I've mentioned this before in other talks or interviews that my quartet literally has never been in a single fight. And I think because a lot of the fights that happen in chamber music, music rehearsals in general, happen because the composer is dead and we come to this music with like a great amount of personal feelings about how it should go, how it should be played, how the other people should be playing their instrument and stuff like that. If we ever don't know what to do or we have an aesthetic disagreement, we should ask the composer. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you see, it's a pretty simple solution. Yeah. yeah. So I went to I went to Juilliard. I was uh, I was a pretty bad cellist. Um, I got. <laughs> 
I wasn't. I, I spent a lot of time just practicing the basics of it because I thought that's what I was supposed to be doing. You know, we were like, talking uh, earlier you, at, at breakfast. I took uh, Jay to Bonnie Lewis this morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you were saying that your first cello teacher actually didn't play the cello. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so we were in a I, yeah we were in a funny uh, situation where I had met this lady. Well, I guess my my dad had met this lady. And she f somehow found out that I was playing cello, and she was asking him who my private teacher was. He said he didn't have a private teacher. Like he, he, neither of my parents were musicians; they didn't know how this stuff works, so they just figured you like teach yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, like, "Well, that's not going to work. So come over to my place for lessons." We started going over, and basically, I was getting free lessons in exchange for helping her. Um, like get groceries, pick up her medication, stuff like that. So for six years we were doing that, um, which was actually super lucky because we wouldn't have been able to afford lessons. And then um, she didn't play cello, she played the piano with one finger. Um, but she was super intense. She was, yeah. she really, uh, I think the idea of like what are you trying to convey to people, like what is music about? What does it mean? It's not, you know, about hitting the right notes or, you know, being technically flawless or whatever. And uh, she was really intense about that. She didn't care if you messed up or were playing the wrong key signature or whatever, but if you were playing the right intention, the right intensity, um, that was what was really important. But I did end up leaving her, I, would, I held my bow like a club. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't, I still can't play in tune. Can't work on that. Um, so, what's a typical year for you? I mean, do you play, do you play, a, you have a trio, you have a quartet, you do solo concerts. Mm -hmm. um, how many performances a year do you do and how does it sort of break out? Because you, you seem wildly busy. It's pretty busy, yeah. yeah. Maybe you play like 95 concerts a year, huh? I don't know like that. <laughs> but the, you know, I think that's not a... 35 of those will be at the old high music. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, yeah, it's not. Uh, it's actually not the number of concert that concerts that are stressful. It's, it's that it's the rep. Yeah, almost every concert has different repertoire on it, um, and rarely the quartet repeats repertoire. Um, and so between my piano trio and the quartet and the the solo stuff that I do, I think I added up last year, and I regret actually looking at it because I was immediately really depressed. <laughs> uh, just looking at how many new pieces I had learned that year, I think it was like 105 or something like that. And then it made sense to me why I was why feeling like out of my mind. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's good. So d do you and do the quartet just play contemporary music or, I, I mean, the Hildegard von Bingen is, is old, but I mean, as a cellist, do you, uh, you know, do like six performances of the Dvorak cello concerto a year, or I mean, what's... Yeah, I did, I played, um, what did I play recently? I played the Haydn C major mm -hmm. concerto. So, so I have a really good time doing it on my own. The quartet doesn't. Uh, I think that we all really, we love that music. Yeah. But I think we actually have stepped away from it because there are groups who spend their whole lives cultivating a certain sound or approach to Schubert and things like that. So for us to dip our toes casually into it just to get a gig uh, feels very wrong. And we want to let the people who really like their lives are about that music uh, do that. And we feel similarly about contemporary music. That's what our musical lives are about. We spend a lot of time taking it really seriously and we love doing it. So but we play really old music also. Yeah. So it's basically just the standard repertoire that yeah, we play in the center. Yeah. yeah. So what do you do for fun? I mean, I noticed when I pick, picked you up yesterday, you you travel with a skateboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Depending on how long the trip is, I'll yeah. bring my skateboard with me. <laughs> yeah. Depending on how boring of a place I'm going. Um, I've already told which you. Which is not, not about Ohio. <laughs> You haven't been on the skate park here. You haven't been yeah. on it. No, I saw two by here. It was like full of a bunch of middle schoolers who were like better than I'll ever be. Right. It's cool. I learned something from that. But I'm going to Boston right after this, so that's why I brought skateboard. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of boring. So you've commissioned lots and lots of new work, and you've worked with a lot of composers. Um, are there any sort of particularly memorable um, things that happened with any of them that uh, stand out? Like stories? <laughs> yeah, or outrageous stories, or interesting stories, or hmm. surprises. Oh, this one was kind of funny. We, um, 
Oh, I don't know if it's funny. It's like a, it was a little depressing at the time, but in retrospect, it was really funny. We, um, the quartet got asked uh, by Carnegie Hall to do a new Philip Glass quartet. And for, I mean, we grew up with Philip Glass's music, and we were, we were like over the moon to get asked to do that. So he wrote his eighth string quartet for us. Um, and we were so excited to play it for him. We tried to get in touch with him and uh, play it for him. He was a little hard to get in touch with and it just ended up not working. So we finally ended up um, only seeing him at uh, backstage at Carnegie right before the concert. It was like 7.55. <laughs> and he kind of like shuffles up and we were wondering like, huh, wonder if like he even got our emails or something. And, like shuffles up and he's like, oh, hey, uh, String quartet. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so, you know, we have a name. Uh, Hi. It's funny. It was actually kind of endearing, though. It's yeah. just like he writes so much music. He's yeah. so busy. Yeah. And you know, like we had no expectations that we were gonna be like the most special thing that ever happened to him. <laughs> it was just kind of funny. funny. Um, you've been performing quite a bit with Patricia Kopachinska. Um When did you meet? And Talk, uh, talk, tell us a little bit about, there's, there's a chemistry between you and her, which is pretty special. Yeah, she has a certain freedom about her playing and spontaneity that I really love. She's, uh, I think she, she cuts like right to the core of what any given piece should be about. Not that there's the one way, but when she does it, it's completely convincing that that's the only way that that piece could possibly go. And she has these really radical reimaginations of standard pieces. And the way that she approaches old music is very much like piece of, uh, approaching a piece of contemporary music where she digests all the information, she acknowledges it, but she really lets go of any tradition. Like, oh, people take time here all the time. That's why she's not going to do it. You know, she's <laughs> always trying to flip things upside down. So I met her in St. Paul, Minnesota. I was subbing with the orchestra there. Um, and I was playing Continuo, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was like she was doing a Bach concerto and I was playing Continuo. And yeah, we just kind of hit it off. Like we weren't actually playing together. Mm -hmm. um, but we kind of got to know each other at rehearsal breaks and stuff. And um, yeah, we just ended up playing together. And then you together. developed some touring projects. As uh, I heard that program that you did at the Armory with her, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, which had the Ravel uh, Sonata, uh, which you and she will perform in Ojai this year. But that was sort of, that was a program that was wild in its contrasts. Mm -hmm. um, how did, the, how did that develop? And you and she really worked on that together. She's done a, an iteration of that program before with uh, Solga Beta. Um, but, you know, we did a lot of tweaking to the program to make it more tailored specifically for us. So we played some Zanakis, we played um, a new piece by Michael Hirsch, whose music is also going to be played here this summer. Yep. Um, yeah, so we, we kind of changed it a little bit, but we may, mainly we kept the integrity of the program in, intact. Mm -hmm. But in our next programs, we're doing the same thing. There's little pieces that we get interested in and want to do, and we kind of email back and forth about what we want to play. I want to ask you some questions about what's coming up in Ojai, but I wonder um, if first you might uh, play something else for us. Sure. Yeah. I have a solo piece by John Zorn that he wrote for me that is a really wild piece. It's based off of a Jackson Pollock painting called Autumn Rhythm, which is in the Met Museum. It's enormous and it's really wild and I think there's no like musical one-to-one -one connections with it, but I think he captures the energy of it and there's this kind of element in Jackson Pollock of like energy made visible. <laughs> And you could see the force that he's like splattering paint on, and you know, doing whatever his processes are. Uh, so I think Zorn hits a similar thing, and there's right. a lot of wild stuff. Right. <laughs> that this piece is best without a jacket. <laughs>
string quartet before the universe was born. Uh, this is a piece that the quartet champions, and um, it's being done on Friday morning at 8 o'clock up at the Besson Hill School. Um, it has uh, sort of un some very unusual instructions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so the whole quartet is tuned differently. Um, he tunes it to one fundamental that is not, it, it's basically not the normal tuning. Uh, so we tune to the higher harmonic partials of a lower pitch that is actually unhearable. Um, so basically some of our strings are tuned to different prime partials of a very low overtone. So that's the first thing. Um, two, it's completely unreadable. The notation is, is <laughs> hilariously bad. Um, and it, but it's one of those things like his ideas were so unique and creative that there's really no easy way, there's no way he can notate this. So it, it has to be this type of oral tradition. Unfortunately, he died before um, we got a chance to work with him. But he, uh, actually in Los Angeles, there was a grant uh, given to Monday evening concerts to basically fly this guy out um, who was a violist who worked really closely uh, with Radulescu and his wife for years and years. So he taught uh, the quartet the notation, um, sort of what different symbols meant, because like he doesn't put a legend or key <laughs> to tell you what the symbols mean. Uh, so he explained all of those things to us, explained the different techniques uh, that you do, and then there is this really weird, it's called it, he calls it, uh, there's two weird bow techniques. One's called uh, udu, and one is uh, called phonetic bowing. So udu is basically if you bow with a rigid arm and then imagine that your bow is being bounced off by a wall, but then you basically teleport to another, <laughs> you teleport to another bow placement. Of, of course. Obviously. <laughs> I mean, just write it down, bro. We know what it means. Like, come on. So, yeah, so it, it's this weird thing that he, call, he calls it like phase shifting. Like, it doesn't make any sense. It's really, really weird. Uh, so, it, he's extremely up in the clouds, very mystical. And then the phonetic bowing is very cool. It, it's at the top of every page, he has, uh, he has quotes from uh, the Tao Te Ching. And that's the rhythm that you play. So, your left hand is doing something totally different. Your right hand. You basically internally, you know, intone this mantra over and over in your head for the rhythm of the bowing. And sometimes you have to be synchronized, and sometimes you have to be desynced. Um, so we spent a lot of time, you know, practicing uh, saying the Tao Te Ching. Wow. Like, practice not doing. Practice not being. <laughs> won't hear that. <laughs> no, although I've often wondered, if, just we were talking about this spelled, earlier, yeah. whether, I don't know, whether the experience is enhanced by knowing that's, you know, what we're saying, mm -hmm. um, or if it's something that is not necessarily necessary to the enjoyment of the piece, because on its own, it's a really beautiful and unique sounding piece, mm -hmm. so, but at the same time, the words that we're saying internally in our minds are also, like, incredibly beautiful, so. Um, on Sunday morning, you're doing the Ninth String Quartet by Haas. Um, and uh, this is a commission uh, from the quartet. Um, this is another big, big piece. And this also has a very unusual requirement from the composer. We have to memorize an hour of music and then play it in total darkness. Yeah. This will be at Besson Hill School, um, and the theater will be completely black. Um, yeah. um, and the musicians, because they've memorized it, there's no need for stand lights. So it's the, the, it's the most bizarre sensation because you, you can't. You don't know where you are, you can't see your hand, you can't see anything. And this music is wafting about. Yeah, for for me, having uh, performed this quartet and his third quartet, which is also in the dark, um, and then having seen it, also experienced it as an audience member, um, it's really, it sounds kind of silly because it's, it's such a basic idea of just 
you know, we're gonna get all these people together and we're gonna play music for them in the dark. It's not that crazy, but once you're in the room and you're in this like entombing blackness, um, yeah, it's. I mean, it's really. I mean, we're taping up the you know, the, 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 the the signs, oh. the the light that comes in under the doors, and everything. Uh -huh. it, it's a very weird feeling to like open your eyes and not having any difference between closed and open. <laughs> um, but it's actually, I feel like it's a communal exercise in trust, and I think, you know, because there's obviously nothing that's going to happen, but. You do kind of have like moments of slight internal panic, which is like, <laughs> what am I doing? Um, so you kind of really have to like trust the people around you, trust the musicians. And it's and an hour long. You kind of give over your agency a little bit over to this piece that takes you on this really incredible journey, and it feels very much like the primordial <coughs> genesis of music. It's it all is focused on just intonation and um, different types of tunings of pretty basic chords. Um, which doesn't sound like it could sustain itself for about an hour, but uh, he gets pretty high up into the upper harmonics of things, and then uh, it, that gives it a very unusual harmonic timbre. So it's it's a totally unique piece. Every time I've played it, there's been people who come up afterwards and like the, that changed my life. <laughs> which is something that doesn't happen all the time. Which is good. Well, um, let me ask you about one other thing that, we, that you're doing. The, the quartet is featured in one of Patricia's two staged concerts called Dies Irae uh, on Saturday night. This is in the bowl. Um, now I don't want to I don't want to give away the some of the theatrical things that will happen in this, but there's one rather extended part uh, where where we started with the old and the new. Uh, where what I call it the Bieber crumb sandwich. Um, you want to describe that? Not Justin. <laughs> not Justin Bieber. No. And Ignat Bieber, his <laughs> evil twin. Yes. <laughs> great, 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 one of them is Bieber uh, Battaglia, and then the other one is Black Angels by George Crumb, an American composer. Uh, they're both, at its core, about war. Um, Battaglia is, I can't remember which war that was about. Was that the War of Roses? I think so. That, something like that? Yeah. Um, and that has a ton of extended techniques in it. It's a really old piece, so it's really weird you, you're hearing this basically Baroque ensemble with harpsichord, but everyone's like, you know, hitting their sticks on the wood, like there are parts that sound like Zorn. It's just like, there are parts where everyone's singing different uh, folk songs together, and it was supposed to be like, those were the, the drunk soldiers who were like homesick and they're singing. Um, so you're getting all these things that are in different keys, different time signatures, and it's a total cacophony. It's like Charles Ives, um, but you know, way back when. And so that's being contrasted with Black Angels, which was a piece that was written about the Vietnam War. Um, there are a lot of things that he, you know, musically, we're amplified, we're doing a whole lot of trills and glissandos, and he calls that music of the electric insects. Um, and what's this actually, what it's evoking is, yes, insects, but also um, uh, helicopters, things like that. So I think that idea of war, maybe, and those pieces that are about war give you an idea about the, uh, like the gravity of the program that Patricia's putting together. But then you've got this very, very old music and this very new music, and it's actually, uh, it doesn't seem so different. That's the astonishing thing, yeah? Um, I'd like to just ask you one sort of closing question. Um, uh, you know, we often hear comments from people who uh, say, well, you know, I, I don't like that kind of contemporary music. Uh, what, what advice do you give people when they, uh, they say that? Uh, how should people approach some of these you know, really crazy, but beautiful and important pieces of music, which are simply not in frames of reference. Yeah. Well, I think one thing for sure that I really believe in is that uh, you don't have to like everything. Um, and it's actually, I think it's a, it's maybe one of the mistakes of, of how classical music is presented nowadays, that every single piece of year has to be the greatest masterpiece ever written. And that's just not the case. Like, if you go back and you play 
next to a Beethoven symphony, you play a symphony by Dussek. Like, who is Dussek? <laughs> no one remembers, because the, the music is, it's good, it's fine, but it's just like, it doesn't have that, whatever it is that's kind of intangible that you can't quantify or teach. Uh, and so, working a lot in contemporary music, we play a lot of pieces that um, maybe are not the greatest masterpiece ever written, but uh, in the quartet, we're gonna basically give everything that we have to try to do it justice and give it a fair shake. Um, but as a listener, I think it's totally fine to dislike pieces. I actively encourage disliking it and telling us <laughs> what you hated. Um, but most of all, I think just going into a concert experience and not expecting anything and just kind of having open ears and not knowing where it'll take you and being okay with that. Because I think the journey of, of the journey itself is the most enjoyable part. You know, we, uh, we read so much today that somehow classical music is dying or even dead. Do you agree with that? Yeah, let's give it up. No one liked it in the first place. <laughs> no, I think it's hard to, it's like hard to quantify, uh, I don't know, like how do you quantify culture and like the health of culture? Um, usually it's maybe like seeing how well different institutions are doing, and I think if you're measuring the success of culture based off of the success of institutions that maybe you're looking in the wrong places. Um, at least in my experience, I primarily play chamber music. Um, a lot of my friends play in orchestras, and obviously you worked for years in orchestras. And um, From my perspective, there are more composers now than ever who are doing such a diverse amount of writing. There's no school of composition right now. It's not like you're writing serial music or minimalist music and you have to belong to a camp. I mean, now you could write anything that you want and serious groups will play it. It's not just, there, there are no um, stylistic stratifications and there are more performers who are super qualified who want to play all this stuff. A lot of performers who are getting bored of playing orchestra are playing the same rep over and over again. And when they do play that rep, they want to have it in, have it be in a particular context where it's actually exciting and fresh again. Um, and I think that doesn't happen if you're just playing it every week and doing the same thing over and over again. Um, so from my perspective, the level of playing is insanely high. There are so many composers doing super interesting things. There are a lot of presenting organizations who want to present it. So for me, all of those <laughs> things add up to the fact that it's actually doing really well. I think it's a golden age. Oh, so, yeah. Absolutely, I think so. Um, would you play one last thing? For sure. Us? Thank you.